instead of asking the question, where are we when, perhaps it's better to ask the question, how do we know when? We've arrived at that place where not only the three levels of life, cause and effect, the occult, and oneness unite seamlessly in the moments of our life and we live intensely in the present. But by their absence we realize that our relationship with life has changed fundamentally. So the stories of these last days are to help perhaps uh, assist us in recognizing what those absences are to give us confirmation since it's not a place or a state that indeed something has happened. This story has been told before and just to clarify there's an interesting difference between fakirs, dervishes and Sufis. If you care to explore this. But this story is the story of a fakir, a wandering fakir. But this fakir had a golden cloak, a golden cloak that was embedded with precious gems. And as is the way with fakirs and dervishes, their wanderings seem to follow a pattern. And as it was with this fakir, he became known far and wide and was recognized for his golden cloak. One day, when he was walking the road, singing a song to the wonders of the life of being free and unfettered, poor, when a band of robbers accosted him and hearing his song said, well, since you have no attachment, we'll divest you of your golden cloak. Well, the fakir argued with them that this cloak was a gift from God and that they would be punished severely if they stole this cloak. And they just laughed at him and said, well, we'll think of that when we're in the tavern drinking after we've sold the golden cloak. So they beat him thoroughly, left him battered on the side of the road and took his golden cloak. Now, when he got up, nursing his bruises and his injuries and resuming his journey, wondering what the meaning of all of this was when God had been so kind to him up to date and bringing doubts into his mind. He turned a corner and there in front of him lay all the robbers lying in pools of their own blood and hanging from the branch of the tree under which they lay was hanging his golden cloak. 
he realized that the robbers had come to the conclusion that the cloak would have no value if they cut it into pieces. So they had obviously fought over the cloak and killed themselves in the process. So the fakir took down his golden cloak and again taking on that state of absence of doubt where God takes care of things. He put the golden cloak on once again and went off down the road. But after some time and more wanderings, he found himself in the midst of a battlefield where warring armies, sultan and an emperor, were fighting. And as it happened, that sultan who won the battle captured our fakir as a treasure of the battle and took him back and incarcerated him in his palace. But because the sultan was a sultan and had a certain belief system and therefore a reverence for wandering fakirs and dervishes, he treated him quite well and allowed him to keep his golden cloak. But after some time, and because the sultan would confer with the fakir from time to time, so a certain amiable relationship was set up between them. It was evident to the sultan that the fakir was not happy. So he asked him, why are you not content? In this palace I give you all of the things that will make your life pleasant. And the fakir said, well, I miss my life of wandering. I miss my family. Oh, said the sultan, well, you know, I did win you on the battlefield, so you are a trophy of war. So you would have to buy your freedom. What do you have with which you could buy your freedom? And the fakir could think of nothing. But the sultan said, what about your golden cloak? It has value. If you sold it, you would certainly make enough to buy your freedom. Well, the fakir was very reluctant to do so, but his freedom was valued very highly. So it was decided that the golden cloak would be sent to his family and sold so that he would have enough money to be free. And the sultan sent a messenger with the golden cloak and it was duly sold for much less than its worth in the marketplace and the money sent back, which enabled the fakir to buy his freedom. But life was not the same for him after this. In his wanderings, no one recognized him. He was just a poor, wandering fakir, not even recognized as a fakir. So life was miserable. He was like a beggar. He received many beatings along the way, as beggars are wont to do. But then, after a long time and much, much travel, he was sitting under a tree on the side of a certain road with a small fire 
where he was cooking the few scraps that he'd managed to scrounge, when all of a sudden he heard a great clamour and a clanging and wailing. And taking, quickly putting out his fire, he hid behind the tree until towards him came an entourage carrying a funeral bier with the wife of the dead being walking beside the bier wailing, lamenting. Now that group had been travelling a great distance and so they stopped to rest under the tree and the fakir was able to hear the woman's tale of woe as she told the virtues of her husband and how he died in his youth before his time. And in the fakir there was a great stirring, a great feeling. He himself had suffered so greatly and he felt deeply for the pain of the lamenting wife but he felt he had no gifts of solace to give her so he remained hidden behind his tree but the wails of the woman grew so loud in his ears, his heart and his soul that something brought him out from behind the tree to confront the woman. She tore her clothes when he asked her what was it that caused such deep grief and so she told her story but her wails and her sobbing became so great that she even took off the shroud that covered the coffin of her husband and the fakir gasped in surprise because there on the corpse was his golden cloak. The wife could see that he was greatly shocked and so she asked him and he told his story. He told his story of the robbers. He told how he'd been enslaved captured by the sultan. He told his tale of woe, of the beatings. And the wife stopped her sobbing and she said, I see that your suffering has been great and even though mine also is deep and painful, I feel for you how can I assuage your pain? And immediately she thought, yes, and she took off the golden cloak from over the corpse of her husband and gave it to the fakir. After resting, the funeral went on its away and the fakir was left. But when he looked at the golden cloak and looked at his life, he no longer had any heart to put the cloak around his shoulders. So he made a bundle out of it 
and carried it on his shoulder. He recommenced his wanderings and before too long on the road he met an old wandering hermit beggar somewhat like himself but this beggar seemed to have some presence it was like you would say a fakir meeting one of his kind or a dervish meeting one of his kind or a Sufi meeting one of his kind and they got into conversation and the hermit asked the fakir what are you carrying on your back and the fakir took out his bundle and revealed his golden cloak. Oh, said the hermit, this has great value. It must be worth 10,000 dinars. Why are you not wearing it? Why don't you sell it? The fakir told his story. And then the fakir said, I have no heart to wear it. I don't know why I'm still carrying it with me. Here, here, you take it. And so the old hermit took off his own patched work cloak and put on the golden cloak and when he did an amazing thing happened his grey hair and beard turned from white to black his face returned to youthfulness he became a splendid being. The fakir fell down on his knees in front of this obviously angelic creature and this being said to him when you sold it bargained with it, wore it with pride. You did not know its value. Now, giving it freely and willingly from deep within your soul, you can know the value of that which has been with you all your life. What does the golden cloak represent for us? How does it relate to this question, how do we know, how do we know that now with the three levels of existence, now seamless, one present in the moments of our life, <coughs> Can we know by their absence that something has changed? Our relationship with life is fundamentally different. Where are we then? 
What does this golden cloak represent for us that's been with us all our life, discarded, battered, sold? and yet remains with us with the possibility now that we know its value. 